Hello, it's Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada, and uh, standing behind me here are a couple of 1980s Jaguars. These are uh, XJS SCs, uh, and they are uh, still with the uh, V12 engine uh, that debuted in the car in 1976. So uh, since I uh, came across these cars, um, and I put the brown one and bring a trailer, and I've done some other videos uh, you know, uh, walk arounds of that particular car and driving that particular car. Um, I thought I'd do a general video about uh, the XJSs in general and why I think that they are uh, a great uh, classic car buy at the moment. So um, let's turn this camera around. I'll go through the cars. I'll do a brief history of them. Uh, I'll give you my assessment after after buying two of them and uh, and reconditioning them and spending the money on them and getting them ready. Um, I, I, I do have a long history with the Jaguar. I just um, well, I was about born in one, um, and uh, my dad had an XJ, XJS when it was new in 1976, and I just finished a, a restoration of a V12 E type as well. So I'll try to put together all of that and um, give you my opinion. Um, of uh, why I think these are great cars, uh, especially in uh, today's overheated market. They remain uh, one of the few used car or classic car bargains at the moment where everything else seems to have kind of gone through the roof. So let's turn this camera around and I'll give you a closer look at these two old Jaguars. So let's start with a very brief history of Jaguar as we know it. Um, I won't get into too much detail here, but Jaguar was really a one-man show for the first, you know, 30, 40 years uh, with um, uh, William Lyons, okay? So um, he created the Jaguar brand uh, post-war uh, with the XK120. And, and this was the, and this was the, this had the debut of the famous Jaguar twin cam engine and it was a sensational car with 120 mile an hour performance and a lovely twin cam engine. It wasn't the first British twin cam engine. There was an Aston Martin, well, it was a W.O. Bentley design for Lagonda that Aston Martin, that David Brown bought um, and put in the DP2. But this was the first um, kind of mass production twin cam engine. So we then have the Jaguar XKs uh, and uh, they get fitted to the competition cars, the C-Type and the D-Type. They win them all five times, uh, uh, two with the C and three with the D-Type, including three in a row with the D-Type. The D-Type differs a little bit from the original Twin Cam 6, and then it's got a wide angle head. Um, and it was that engine that, uh, in I think 1954, went to their they, they came up with a, a design for a, a V12 version of that with two of those engines sharing a common crankcase at 60 degrees. And that engine had uh, six SU carburetors and four cams, and it was about a five liter engine. Okay, so they had drawings for that engine as early as 1954. All right, so they put the the twin cam six in into production and we get the we get the E-Type, uh, which supersedes the XK 120, 140, and 150, and the E-Type comes out in 61, and then it's a little bit, it wasn't, it was a fabulous car, of course, in the era, but it didn't do so well meeting emissions and safety regulations, and it kind of grew, you know, a little bit more awkward as, uh, as the time went on with bumpers and increased air. Uh, the size of the air inlets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, was getting down on power, so it was down to, I think, 180 horsepower. And so Jaguar dusted off the V12 engine, uh, the drawings for it anyway, and they decided to try to put the V12 engine in their XJ sedan, which would make it the XJ12, and they would uh, also um, uh, put it in the final version of the E-Type. Okay. But it was a four cam engine and it was very physically large and it wouldn't really fit under the bonnet of an E-Type. Um, and then uh, the engineers at the time who were Harry Monday and Walter Hassan, uh, brilliant engineers that have a long history in British motorsport 
from, uh, e from the W. O. Bentley and Wolf Bernardo specials of Brooklyn's to, to the uh, ERA, which is a Riley based special, to the BRM, which is that V16 monster, the overcomplicated monster from 1950, to the original JAG uh, six cylinder engine, twin cam. And those engineers were then responsible for making a production version of that V12. They decided on a single overhead cam per bank um, because of the packaging and the torque characteristics and, uh, and also ease of servicing and ease of manufacture, okay? And that engine is what we see here. It was carbureted in the E-type and, uh, and then fuel injected with the X3S. So when the E-type went out of production in 1974, this was, the X3S was its replacement. William Lyons really had a firm idea of what he wanted uh, and uh, commanded a lot of respect uh, for with his uh, with his employees and he didn't want um, he didn't want another e type he wanted something that was more a businessman's coupe uh, so uh, that was the XGS. Malcolm Sayer, who is an aerodynamicist who was responsible for the d type and c type, also did the initial pro designs for the XJS as well, although he died before it uh, it came out. Um, so the V12 engine from the Series 3 e type was put in a new car that was a businessman's coupe, the XJS. It came out in 19, I think late 1975 uh, as a uh, 76 model. It was, the uh, the press weren't that happy. I mean, they had they, you know, everybody agreed that it was a fine car for what it was, but they really uh, were disappointed Jaguar didn't um, continue the uh, sporting lineage of the XK. Um, anyway, so it got off to a little bit of rough start and it got off to, um, you know, a lot of unfavorable press, uh, kind of thinking, well, what's Jaguar doing with this big coupe? We love the E-Type so much. Okay. Um, but the funny thing about the XJS is it was in production for 76 all the way up to 95. Um, so it had a huge production run, um, you know, over, uh, you know, over, um, uh, you know, 20 years uh, in production. And they sold more XJSs than they sold E-types. They sold 115,000 XJSs. It got a little bit of lift, it got a, a little bit of a lift in the, uh, uh, in the um, uh, 80s with a Michael May designed um, engine and what they did is they worked on the fuel consumption and basically put in a stratified charge head which was a little pre-chamber which swirled the, uh, 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 the, the combustion gases and made for a more efficient engine a much higher, um, a much higher compression ratio not unlike what Honda did with the CVCC engine. Um, so that came out in the early 80s, that was the HE, and then the engine was still continued to be developed into the 90s with a six liter version um, that even found its way into Le Mans, a seven liter version, and it won Le Mans in, uh, well, it won the European Touring Car Championship, uh, an XGS did, in 84, and it won Le Mans in 1988 and 1990. It won Le Mans with an engine that was designed in 1954, won the race in 1990. All right, so the racing provenance uh, of this engine uh, is, uh, you know, is, is unquestioned. And, you know, you can't have a bad engine that wins Le Mans. It's 80% of the lap is full throttle. Um, if there's the slightest weakness, um, there's no way it's going to last the distance. So from an engineering standpoint, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a first-class design. Now on the rest of the car, um, the XJS was built on a um, shortened XJ uh, sedan uh, platform. So I guess that's why it's an XJS instead of an XJ6. And um, those cars uh, were some, you know, keeping in mind these cars were, were uh, designed in the early 70s. They were some of the first cars with the, uh, the full monocoque uh, bodies instead of a, a body on frame. And initially when Jaguar was uh, d um, testing these cars, when they went, went through development, um, they were having a hard time 
isolating the NVH, noise, vibration, and harshness, um, because the um, vibrations and so on from the drivetrain would create resonances in the interior. And um, uh, William Lyons wanted the cars to be uh, exceptionally refined. Uh, grace, space, and pace were the, was the motto back then. Um, and so what they did is they isolated the engine and the uh, rear end from the body on subframes with then thick rubber mounts. Um, and so, you know, you've got the E-type rear end with, uh, you know, dual uh, coilover shocks uh, per side and inboard rear brakes, you know, set in a uh, subframe and that gets lowered. And so what, what, and the same, basically the same thing on the front of the car, there is a subframe that carries the front suspension and that sort of cradles the uh, bottom of the engine. It makes servicing a little bit more difficult, um, but what it does is it uh, um, gives the XJS, it's extremely quiet. I mean, it, I think it's as quiet as a Rolls Royce um, and as refined. And uh, so you get this really uh, smooth and silent uh, ride with, um, without any you know, unpleasant uh, NVH or resonances in the, in the cabin. It was extremely quiet. I mean, I did a, a video driving the XJS and you can hear me perfectly without a microphone. And uh, I tried that in a 911 and you can't hear anything. Okay. So that's kind of what uh, makes the cars a little bit special. Um, and, uh, you know, but on the, on the, you know, on the, on the, on, on the ne negative side, it does make the servicing a little bit tough. So let me, let me just explain that a little bit uh, in more detail. I'll turn the camera around. All right, so first of all, um, I'll try to show you underneath the car here. Um, you can see, um, well, you can see that there's that subframe that uh, maybe I'll, sh I'll put in a better picture that connects the front suspension. So you don't actually see the whole oil pan of the car from underneath because the subframe is in the way. So to get at the uh, oil pan gaskets and so forth, you've got to take the subframe off and take the front suspension with it. Um, on top of the car, it looks like a little bit of a nightmare and it is complicated. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not as bad as you might think. You've got to kind of break it into the various systems. Um, you know, there is a relatively complicated fuel system um, and uh, it routes the, th the uh, and the fuel rails go around the, uh, you know, around the cylinders and then it, it routes the fuel in the return uh, through the AC system to cool it, okay? And then there's a, there's a auxiliary tank in the back where that's deposited. So that's a little bit complicated um, uh, because of the routing of the, of the fuel. And if you don't, if your AC doesn't work, then your fuel isn't gonna get cooled. And so that can lead to vaporization and hot start issues. So, you know, the, the XJS is kind of a car you just need to keep on top of. Um, the AC compressor is relatively uh, accessible, okay? So that's one thing about the car. Um, also, you've got, uh, you know, a lot of little rubber hoses and quite a bit of heat from the V12 engine. And so those hoses, uh, uh, can, they can be vacuum hoses or fuel hoses, can crack with age and temperature and so forth. And it's a good idea to go and replace those and also you know, this one has new spark plug wires and, uh, and uh, you know, that is good as well, okay? So good to do as well. And so you wanna keep on top of all of these hoses, and there's lots of them, um, uh, to, you know, make sure they don't split and cause leaks in the vacuum system or fuel leaks or, okay, which are worse. Okay, so um, because of the, um, the, the really high compression ratio, uh, 12 to one, 12 and a half to one, uh, which is characteristic of stratified charge engines, okay, which this is with a Michael May, uh, I think he called it a fireball uh, combustion chamber. Uh, with 12 cylinders and high compression, you need a really powerful spark. And so there's two coils, I guess one's there, and then one lives um, at the front of the engine. Where is that? I guess there. Um, so that's kind of a little bit funny where you've got the two coils and uh, the distributor lives right in the center there. And I know the distributors can um, 
need servicing and they can stick and that can be a problem as well. Okay, so, uh, you know, those all are issues. And then we've got a cooling system, um, which again is also relatively complicated. So you layer all that stuff on top of one another and take a look at it, and it looks a little bit frightening. Um, but the way to approach it is just to kind of break it into the into the four systems, the, the electrical, the cooling, the vacuum, and the fuel, and then you know, look at those pieces and then just do everything at once, okay? And then, you know, one year you might do one thing and the next year you might do another thing and, uh, but go through it and do everything properly. And then I think you have a reliable car. Now, a, 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 a trained Jag mechanic, somebody who knows these cars and worked on them, will give you all of the best advice. And, uh, you know, that I think is a key component of owning, owning one of these cars, either invest uh, the time yourself to understand it and to be able to work on it yourself or find, uh, you know, a trusted mechanic who's going to look after it, not just throw some parts at it, uh, but look at the long-term uh, health of the car and get a service regimen uh, that uh, that makes sense. Okay, so other, other than that, the one good thing about it is none of these parts are particularly expensive. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the other cars, like you know, uh, some of the German, like a Porsche, some of those parts are just eye-wateringly expensive. And I haven't found that with the Jag, okay? Um, I found that uh, all the parts are pretty reasonable. So you might spend a little bit more on labor, but you're gonna spend less on parts. Um, with an 80s car, generally, well, generally they made more of them. Uh, than, you know, a 60s or 50s, 60s or 70s car. And they're new enough that, and plentiful enough, that you can buy one that doesn't have any body issues, that doesn't have any rust, that you don't need to put new floors in. And that's the really expensive stuff. And that's, those are the hardest skills to find of all, is getting a talented metal guy. Um, so when you get into the 80s, uh, you know, the, the undercoating is better, the galvanized panels were better, and you generally don't find rusted out cars. These were never really driven in the winter. Um, and so, you know, if you choose reasonably well, you're not gonna get a rusted car. So you, automatically you just save that massive expense of body restoration. Um, the major components, the engine, the gearbox, differential, braking system and so on, generally don't give any trouble at all. And so you don't, and, and these cars are not known for like, you know, catastrophic failures because of a weak component or bore scoring or IMS issues or whatever, whatever, whatever they might be. So, you know, and, and they're, you know, not that uncommon with some of the late model cars. Uh, where you can, you know, where the where you can grenade engines. Uh, so they're not really known for that. Yeah, the diagnostics are a little bit trickier. Yes, it's a little bit harder to find somebody to work on the car. Um, yeah, it might take longer to sort out some of the problems. But when you do, the parts aren't that much. And then, you know, the rest of the car is actually pretty good. So overall, when you consider the low purchase price, I mean, I, don't, I think the best XJS in the world is probably only $50,000, I mean, unless you're talking about the race cars. So, you know, you're not talking about a high capital outlay. Um, you know, to sort everything out, and, and if you did everything, like I spent $12,000 on that Brown Jaguar, because uh, it just kind of needed everything. Um, but that's not unusual. I, I, I'm used to spending $20,000 on air-cooled Porsches. Um, so it's not unreasonable to bring a car back uh, and get all the maintenance up to date if it's a high performance car. Um, and so I think the overall sort of ratio between your capital outlay and the, you know, annual maintenance um, and, the, uh, and what you get out of the car, which is the driving enjoyment and day-to-day -day usability. And, you know, the cars have a big trunk. Uh, they're practical. You know, the, uh, the coupes have little seats in them, but they've got a big square trunk. And it's refined and it's comfortable and you get a, a wood and leather, a Conalloy leather interior and wool carpets and so on. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great driving experience. It's a great place to be. It's a great looking car. Um, 
you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think, I think it, it makes a lot of sense. It's nice to have in this era of, um, you know, overheated market for new cars and classic cars, you know, when, when you know, the Alphas and Fiat's and Triumphs and stuff I used to drive in university are now fifty and sixty and seventy thousand dollar cars in some cases. It's nice to find something that you could actually, you know, see that is a bargain. I mean, this extra S is going on bring a trailer. It may or may not bring bring twenty thousand US, uh, and uh, that, that you can hardly you can't even buy a bug eye Sprite for twenty thousand US now. So I think that uh, that uh, you know it's really great value and. The restoration costs have gone through the roof, you know, um, even something simple like this Land Rover that I'm doing, you know, is $100,000, um, you know, so the, you know, the costs of restoration, finding people to do restoration work, especially metal work, uh, is very difficult. Um, and uh, to do anything, you know, basically you're looking at six figures. So this is a way to get in the classic car market. You don't have to have the big, big expenditures of metal work and body work and, you know, new, making new panels and stuff like that. And you've got, uh, you know, something you can drive every day, comfortable and refined and smooth. And with a little bit of care when you buy it and choosing the right mechanic, um, you know, I think you'll have, you'd have a good uh, experience with one of these cars. I, so I think MXJS is, uh, you know, a really great classic car buy. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you very much for viewing Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary. Well.